Drive on WFLA now. Feel good and live your best life with Bloom Health Club. Here's Gail Guayardo. Hi, everyone. We are talking about a new year, a new you. This is the time when so many of us want to reinvent ourselves. But why is it that some people find that so easy to do and then others of us, we just get stuck? Well, there is a data-driven way to change the course of your life. It's called the McGuckin Method. Here to tell us all about it is Audrey McGuckin, the founder and CEO. It is a pleasure to have you as a member of the Bloom Health Club. Yeah, thanks for having us, Gail. Absolutely. So I think this is so fascinating. Before we deep dive into what you do, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't welcome in our amazing digital reporter and producer, Brody Waddell, who's going to be jumping in here. Hello. Brody, welcome. Hello. So um, I want to talk about this incredible method that I actually had the chance to try myself, or at least a portion of it anyways. Um, but I want to talk about you. You've had such an incredible career, and it's what's brought to you to where you are today to be able to help CEOs, team members, and individuals alike. Yeah. And, um, you know, I love that question. I always get inspired when I reflect back and you don't always get a chance to. I left school when I was 16. Um, it was during the Margaret Thatcher era, which meant that there um, were a lot of strikes. There wasn't a lot of money going around. So I didn't go to school, as you would call it in the US, and we call it, you know, college. So I didn't go to college, went straight to a factory, um, started working there for a couple of years. And um, I would I would see this this woman when I was working there and I would think, oh, my gosh, she's having such an impact on people. I wonder if I could do that. And then I thought, oh, no, maybe I can't. But anyway, next thing I, I thought, well, maybe I can be a receptionist. Um, so then I get a receptionist job and I thought, well, maybe I can be an HR assistant. Um, and Forbes Alexander, who is the, the CFO at a local company here in Jabel, um, he saw something in me and um, he said, Audrey, I know you've been filing the letters and doing some of the admin work, but we'd love to sponsor you through college. And so um, I ended up getting a four-year business degree and Forbes said, I think you can go further. And he said, I want you to go and do your master's. And then after I did my master's, he said, um, actually, you've you're out of capacity here. There's no more jobs for you in Scotland. Would you Would you go to Florida to our headquarters? Um, and I said, sure, why not? So, you know, I do have some trailblazing in my, my background. And I came to Florida. St. Pete has been home for the last 25 years. Um, I was with Jabel for 20-something years. And, and during that time, I, I lived in France and Spain and Germany. And I lived in Asia. Um, for a number of years as well. And when I came back from Asia, I was still with Jabel. But um, that was the moment where I knew I wanted to do something different. Um, and one of the things that um, I always encourage people to do is explore your ideas with others. Um, you and I talked about this, Gail. I, I spoke to the chairman at Jabel at the time and he said, whatever you do, please make sure you take a global job and use your skills. And I never really thought about that before. And then I spoke to one of the other board members and she said, I don't know what you're wondering about. The answer's obvious. You do what you do, you love it, go to Office Depot, print a business card and start your own business. And so I did, but I, I almost needed permission to do that. And through that experience, what we've done is we've codified how to unlock the potential in all leaders. So fascinating. Um, you know, what I love also about your story is that through your years with Jabil, um, you couldn't walk into a meeting without data. Like that was expected. You just didn't get to go in and wing it. You had to come in with numbers. And so as part of the McGuckin method, you know, people that you work with, be it the CEO or everybody on the team that you're working with or the individual takes a specific test. It's not a long test. It takes about six minutes. It's a test with a lot of history, four decades of proven track record. Tell me about the test that I actually had the opportunity to take. And I thought 
it was fascinating. Yeah, it's it's an assessment. It's a behavioral assessment, and it measures your leadership preferences. It's called Predictive Index. I love it because I've used it for decades at um, Jable, and I've used it for the last six years in my own consulting practice. The reason I love it is it can be used in 52 different languages. So we get to use it with our clients in Taiwan, in China, in Poland. Also, it's scalable. It only takes six or seven minutes. And the reason it's different from other assessments is it tells us how you're wired, Gail. But here's the piece I love. It tells us how am I feeling in this moment? And when there's a difference between how you're feeling and how you're wired, that takes more energy. And you and I had a great conversation about how you're wired and yet here's some of the ways you're feeling. And that's the first moment we start to unlock how people are feeling. And I feel like it also um, jump starts the conversation because a lot of times you may not recognize your strengths or to what depth your strengths run. Um, you know, you might feel your weaknesses. That's for sure. I think a lot of us, it's our weaknesses that keep us back, but that's a starting point. You take that data and you combine it with the conversation and that equals a lot of room to navigate forward in life and become unstuck. Exactly. And what we like to do is triangulate data. So the predictive is one measure that tells us how you're wired. We're going to talk to some of your closest colleagues or friends and they're going to say this is how we experience scale and that helps us with blind spots and then we're going to talk to you to see what do you want we know how you're wired but what's your big dream that's a very complicated question for people to unlock on their own I think this is the perfect opportunity to bring in Brody Waddell because he too has worked in the TV industry. I mean, he's much younger than I am, but he's been in it for a while. He's been on camera. You know, he's worked at different affiliates in the Tampa Bay market. He's traveled around. He's in the digital space now, which is, of course, the fastest growing uh, portion of our industry. And, you know, Brody, I think it's fair to say that especially in our career, you get so myopic and so focused that a lot of times you start to feel trapped in just what you know. Would you say that's fair? Yeah, I would say that's true. Like whether it's even within the industry, just doing one thing, like I write or I talk on air or I do this. And especially if you want to like pivot into any other type of field, it's almost like I'm so stuck in this. How do these translate? Yeah. So that's it, like an interesting perspective. It is. I mean, I, I think about this all the time. I'm like, and it's probably why I've been doing the same job for the last 36 right. years of my life. I know. But I'm like, is there anything else I can do? I have big dreams. I have big ideas. Mm -hmm. But I I get scared. And I think I'm not alone. And back me on this. I think most people feel stuck and afraid and also tethered to that paycheck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. And, and sometimes what we'll do with um, the... Sometimes we'll do it with organizations and we'll, and we'll say to them, um, you know, what's what's your, your, your greatest hopes for this organization? And they might talk about revenue. They might talk about EBITDA. They might talk about profit. But then we say, but what is the difference you want to make? Um, we did work with um, an amazing organization in um, Indianapolis. And the CEO said, I want to make a difference in people's lives. And when he said that, it unlocked everything for, for all of the organization. And so when you translate that to a team, you say, what is, what is the thing that you want to do as the, as the team here? Or Gail, you and I had the conversation to say, what would you do if, the, if money wasn't an object? Yeah. What would you do if there was no social judgment? And I remember when my mom raised me, she would always, always say to me, it doesn't matter what people think. It doesn't matter. Take a chance. There's always, you're always going to make it. It doesn't matter. Just do it. And so I was raised with a lot of um, encouragement around risk taking. Mm. Um, and so one thing that is, is about, we call it self-efficacy, which is, do I believe in myself? And sometimes there's an inner voice where you may not believe 
that you're good enough. So confidence can play a part. Interesting. Interesting. You think that keeps certain people stuck? Or for instance, maybe you're in a field where you are making much more money than you would pivoting into anything else, and so you feel stuck in that. Does that kind yeah, of hold the same Yeah, yeah, and you, you have to help people imagine, well, what if I took a step back to go three forward? Mm-hmm. But leaders won't make that leap unless they have blistering clarity on what it is they want to do. When I started my consulting practice, people would say to me, oh, you're going to be a consultant. I said, no, I'm going to be a CEO of a multi-million dollar consulting practice. Mm -hmm. That's wildly different to being a consultant. Now, a lot of people want to do that, but that wasn't my big dream. Yeah. Do you think that when you take this assessment test and you work with people, regardless of what level that they're at, do sometimes you have real talk with them and say you're, you're really not cut out for what you think that you can do? Or do you, like, do you help people find the path that they should be on? Yeah, and I, and I think that we principally believe that people are really smart. We principally believe that people want to do the right thing. So when we have conversations to say, you know, this would show us how you're wired. This would say that you want to be in an organization where there's a lot of clarity. There's not a lot of ambiguity. This would tell us that you want to be in an environment where you can work on your own. And you're currently in a startup. How's that working for you? And often that's when the light bulb goes off that says, this is actually the last thing I need to be doing as as in a startup because of how I'm wired. But most often... We just need to ask the right questions like we did. Mm -hmm. I only asked you a couple of questions and then suddenly we illuminated something. So one of our superpowers is to ask the right questions. And what I thought was interesting, and I I never really talk about this openly. Where I do talk about it is there's something across the nation called the Great American Teaching, where you get to go into classrooms and talk to the kids about your job and give them something to dream big about. And when I would go to the classrooms, I would divulge to the children um, because I was always so ashamed of it that, I, you know, I, I wasn't a good student. I had, you know, before they could teach you differently and they recognized ADHD or dyslexia or whatever the learning struggle was, there was only really one way to learn. And either you were going to learn that way or you were going to fall through the cracks. And so I wasn't, I always felt like I was struggling and trying to catch up. And I I felt like a failure a lot. And, you know, thank goodness I had a a very strong-willed mom that pushed me and kept pushing me and pushing me and pushing me, not just to achieve, you know, academically, uh, which took me a long time to be to figure out, but just not to be the 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 wallflower or the girl that was too shy to speak up and and I thought it was interesting and I would share that message with the students because I wanted them to believe in themselves to know that whatever the obstacle was that they would be able to get past it. But it was interesting because after I took the test and I was talking to Audrey and it kind of opens up this conversation, you know, she was asking me about my childhood and. I hesitated. I'm like, do I open up to this woman? Do I tell her all this stuff? And, and, and it, and it actually helped because it kind of opens up your own mind to your strengths and your weaknesses and, and what is propelling you forward, but maybe what's holding you back or maybe what's creating those confidence issues or making you second guess yourself. So part of this, Audrey, is the psychology of it all. Yes, it is. And <clears throat> Part of it's the psychology, um, part of it's data, and then part of it's leadership. So what do I mean by that? The leaders that are most successful in today's business world are the leaders who are authentic by far. And employee engagement is determined by authenticity of leaders. So there's billions of dollars at stake here for organizations. But to be authentic, what you did is you said, am I going to open up here or not? And really the question you were asking, am I going to be vulnerable? And vulnerability takes courage. And yet when you're courageous enough to open up, it doubles down on your authenticity. The best CEOs that we have 
tell personal stories. The best CEOs that have the highest revenue are the most authentic. But that takes courage. It does. It does. Because you even said it yourself. Like, a lot of people don't move forward because they're like, what if somebody judges me or how will they perceive me? That's that's also, a f it's amazing how we let other people's perception hold us back. Yes. But one of the things that, that we do with executive leadership teams is to create what we call psychological safety in the room. Gail, you were in my house. Mm -hmm. We sat at the table. We looked out and we were we were next to each other. And I did those things on purpose. We had sticky notes. It didn't feel um, transactional. So we do that on purpose. Catherine and I were in um, Guadalajara with an executive team um, in Mexico. And um, we had what we call our human centered session with them. And there were 18 um, Hispanic men in the room and every one of them cried. Now, our goal is not to go into a room and have them cry, but our goal is to create psychological safety so that they can tell their story, so that they can be a better leader, so that they can then get their business results. Catherine and I went to Taiwan. We were in Taiwan the week before Thanksgiving, and the room was filled with Taiwanese 65-year-plus men. And we thought... We know we have the formula. We know it's going to work. But I wonder. <laughs> and we were in the room and we, we said to the hotel, take every table out the room and put it on the back of the wall. And we want a semicircle. We want no tables between us. We want to create space. Um, we had the CEO go first. And we said to him, what's important to you in your life? And um, when, when he told his story... He was upset and he was emotional. But the bond that that created with that team will never be the same. Gail, your relationship and our minds will never be the same after that conversation. Right. And so imagine where that takes you when you do that with 10 billion, 20 billion organizations and you do it with individual leaders. And imagine how we change the world. Unbelievable. We need to get some of our news directors. And yeah. <laughs> I'm just joking. I, know. I think I, I need to does. take your test too. My goodness. <laughs> but Bertie, you work with like, you know, you do a lot of articles about the mm -hmm. psychology. I mean, what, does this make sense to you as you listen to Audrey talk? Yeah, a lot of that checks out from what I hear. It's interesting what you say too, because a lot of, I mean, I actually have a lot of friends who are CEOs. Oh. And they, it's interesting that you're saying what you're saying about that emotional and the connection thing, because most of them are incredibly analytical minded. Yes. And it's actually kind of hard to talk to them. And some of them can honestly be kind of boring, like, you know, what I like <laughs> to talk with them. So it's interesting to me that that's like the thing you focus on, because I feel like that it probably is the area where a lot of them aren't like devoting as much as their energy to. Yeah. And the reason we think it's important to, to do work with CEOs and businesses and individuals is, um, you know, when I lived in Asia, um, I would say to the, the president, his name was T.P. Ewan, and I said, T.P., why are we not getting to the results we need? And he said, Audrey, the fish rots from the head. Yeah. We have to get to the head of Asia, and then everything will flow from there. And so it matters the tone you set at the top, um, and it matters the environment that you create for your teams and your leaders. Mm, very, very interesting. Let's get back to the individual level because, you know, only a small sliver of the population make it to the CEO level. But having said that, you know, you, you talked to me, Audrey, about three boxes that you, I remember you distinctly drew them out on, on one of the sticky notes that you had. And, you know, one box is the person that stays at the same company and they're the loyal soldier and they've been there for decades I'm raising my hand on that one. And then the second <laughs> one is maybe you try to take a different job or a different, like you know, path in life. And that doesn't work out so great either. But then there's that third box, the box that we all look at other people that they've lived in, where they can, you know, create their own destiny, reach their own heights, you know, go where they want to go in life. And they have the courage and the wherewithal to do it. Where is the disconnect? Why do so many of us have such a difficult time making it into that third box? Mm. Yes, and, and humans are complex, 
And I don't think there's one answer, but I think it's a combination of opening your aperture to what's possible. Martha Stewart didn't start her business till she was 50. Wow. That puts it in perspective. Right. And so it's, can I open my aperture? And sometimes it's a moment in your life or sometimes it's one person that says, I believe in you. And then other times it's working with like us at the McGuckin Group where we can take you through that process, where we can use data. Sometimes it's about confidence. Sometimes it's about imagining. Um, but there's a method we take people through. The first thing we say to them is, what's your purpose in life? And that seems like it's a difficult question and it is a difficult question. So we, we work on that. The next thing we practically do with individual leaders is we say, what would be your must win battles that would help you live a fulfilled life? So if my purpose in life is to, to change um, to change the way leaders live their life and to give back to others. Well, one of my must win battles is I need to be financially independent and have strong financial acumen because the way I do that is to run a company. And to run a company, I must have this financial acumen. It's one of my weakest areas, but it's one of my must-win battles that I focus on. Another must-win battle for me is that I prioritize time with my daughters and my husband, even over work sometimes. Another must-win battle for me is my health. And nobody gets priority over my health because that's mine. And so what does it mean if I say it's a must win battle for me? And when we take people through the process, they have a purpose, then they'll have maybe three to five must win battles. And then for each must win battle, they'll have maybe one or two things that they have to do. For my financial one, I called up my financial advisor and I said, I need time with you one on one to take me through all of this, all of this and all of this before we meet with my husband. Because I want to make sure I'm educated and it's not my strong spot. That's interesting. Right? So what are your must-win battles that help you? Gail, what might your must-win battles be to get to your big dream? We're going to do work on that. Yeah, I mean, it, it's really interesting to think about. And even, you know, and Audrey and I spent, you know, a, a solid hour and a half, maybe two hours at her beautiful home in St. Petersburg, Florida, where she's headquartered. And... um you know, it's hard to answer those questions because you find yourself saying trite things or things that you think you're supposed to stay. But this is this is heavy work that you need to do. And if you want to move to the next level, you got to dig past those layers to, to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think that this is relevant, Brody, for a young man like yourself, finding your way and your mm -hmm. career in life. And then I also think, you know, now that I am not so beholden to four mouths to feed, you know, every, as every time a child launches out of the nest and, you know, I'm not paying for all these college educations, as your children grow up and become more independent, you get a little bit more wiggle room in life. And I think that that's why there's so many, you know, people, but especially women looking at themselves after doing the day in and day out grind and saying, you know what? I want a chance to reinvent myself. So it's it's never too late mm -hmm. to do this kind of work, whether it's early on in your career or whether it's, you know, the, the maybe the, the swan song of your career. Exactly. And I think, you know, in life, we know that we all have at least five or six big transitions. Um, and, and one of those transitions can be, um, some people call it retirement. Other people call it the next season of their life. Another transition is when I come out of college. Mm -hmm. Another transition is when I get fatigue, if I've been at a job for three or five years. So there's, there's moments of truth where we start to question ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. So Audrey, let me ask you, and this might be something that <clears throat> it would be interesting to hear you speak on. Is there something to be said for just being content? This is enough. That's fine. I'm happy. The stress, the added stress, the extra work that it's not worth it yeah how i like to think about it is um uh i engage a lot of help for for me and my business i have a coach 
I have a therapist, I have a psychiatrist. <laughs> and so <laughs> when when I'm working with them, they'll they'll ask me, what do you want out of life? And, you know, sometimes I'll say peace mm -hmm. and contentment. But the definition of that for me, Brody, is different to the definition for you. Mm. Peace and contentment is when I'm running off to Asia and running back again and going to Mexico and then running to Poland thereafter. That's peace and contentment for me because that's my definition. And so this work is deeply personal and not to be judged because what might work for one may not work for another. Right. Yeah. It's, have, in, it's interesting. I, I think about that a lot too because, you know, as we get to the, closer to the empty nester stage of life, you know, my husband's looking for that peace and contentment. Uh, and I'm looking in the mirror going, am I even wired to do that? Like, right. will I just, you know, go out of my gourd when I don't have like 50, I, I, this is something that keeps me up at night. Like, what if I don't have that adrenaline rush that is, uh, and I've right. learned to live off of it. And it's like what drive, it's what propels me. And I, you know, I don't know what I would do without it. I think it's why my late mom worked until she was 87 years old. Yeah. We were looking at her like, and I realized that work was her sport. You know, it's what she loved. Yeah. And the number one piece of advice that I give leaders who are doing this internal work, women or men, it doesn't matter, is you have to start with you. You can't start with, what does my father want? You can't start with, what does my husband want? You can't start with, what are my kids going to think? You have to be selfish and start with you. Otherwise, you'll always be questioning yourself. Otherwise, you'll always be wondering. Interesting. Audrey, how do people get a hold of you? I mean, you're, you do, you're not just for the CEO. You're not just for no. the, you know, the Fortune 500. You're not just for the high level, you've, you've made yourself more accessible recently just to everyday people trying to figure it out. Yeah, and there, there's a couple of things, Gail. Um, we have a book coming out um, in January. It's called um, Regaining the Fire in Your Belly, and it's a practical guide for women leaders. This is specifically for women leaders, um, and it takes people through those practical steps. We also do keynotes. Um, we go to, to organizations and we, we deliver keynotes locally. Um, you can also see us on podcasts. Um, we're on your show as well. And, and we have a lot of workshops that we run. We also have um, a women's leader group here in the Tampa Bay area. Um, it's the Women's Leadership Forum. And so lots of ways to engage with us. But the best way to, to figure it all out is go on to our website, which is www.mcguckengroup.com, and you'll get access to all our materials. I love it. Nice. I want to I wanna, uh, challenge you to take this personality test. I, was ah, blown. I would be happy to. Yes. It was really fascinating yeah. to see. It was almost like... I, I must thought that Audrey was a fortune teller that she could, she <laughs> yeah. knew more about me than I knew about myself after a six minute test. Yeah, that would be fascinating. I took it before I went to her house to kind of meet her in person and, and see what she does. And it, it was super, super interesting. Audrey, I, I think you're a fascinating woman. I'm so glad that we got connected. She's been on Bloom, our global health and wellness show headquartered in Tampa, Florida. I had the opportunity to see one of her amazing annual events, Women on Their Way, and hear the powerful stories of women who have pivoted in their lives and gone in new directions and found that belief in themselves. And that's, you know, I wanted to share it with others so that people that are sitting out there stuck right now that are either listening or watching us, they know that there, there's a way out and there's a, a method to doing so, a right. data-driven one. Very cool. Yeah. And one that, that people can have access to. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's awesome. Audrey, thank you so much for being the newest member of yes. the Bloom Health Club. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you both for having us. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Till next time.